Highest Precinct Commission is Harrietville, and so um, we're here to show you the progression of the plans. This is a diagram of the three-step process that we've implemented. So back in July 2020, we ran our first community engagement session. Unfortunately, it had to be over Zoom because of COVID, and we had um, uh, some presentations about ideas and, and essentially trying to get to the bottom of where the community saw the need for upgrades within the, within the township of Harrietville. Um, the culmination of that information was this plan here, which was essentially, so, so basically the Shire gave us a study area, which is, sorry, it's hard to see, but um, which is basically sort of the center of Harrietville, if you like. And, and we asked the community, where did they see the majority of need for upgrade? And that was the result of this plan here, which is essentially each time someone made a comment, we put a dot on the plan. So I think what this showed to us is that and we talked about a whole range of potential projects from, from the Oval all the way through down to Toronto Dredge, um, the, the Tavaray Pioneer Park area and everywhere in between. What, what we heard at that time was really the majority of the focus we heard should be in Pioneer Tavaray Park, followed by Toronto Dredge car parking area and then quite a bit of interest around the community hall area. So that was, that was session number one. Ed and I went away and we prepared draft versions of the plans that you see here. We came back in February this year and we had a session in the hall here. Can I ask who was at that session? Yeah, okay, we've got a few that, that came to those sessions. We ran them in the, in, at lunchtime in the evening. And that was, the, the idea behind that was to try and show you some preliminary designs to take on board, so to hear some feedback. Um, and since that stage we've been away and we've taken on board the comments and I'd like to talk you through what we heard last time and the, uh, the outcomes that we propose as the progression of, of the designs. Um, and so this is a third round of community engagement. It's sort of an extra add-on that we weren't originally intending to do but the Shire thought it would be good for us to come back and just have another um, opportunity to show you the progression of the plans, to take on board any final comments before they are finalised and adopted. It's important to know that these are concept plans, so there is the whole stage that needs to go ahead of us, which is the detailed documentation and the more sort of fine-tuned resolution of everything that you see here. These are, these are really just concepts, so for instance where we draw a line that might be um, a path we're not actually at the level of knowing exactly what the grading is and, and that sort of thing. But we have gone to the, we have started to talk about surfaces and materials and lighting and planting and a whole sort of strategy for the, what the visual aesthetics of the project will look like. So that's where we are, third step in the process. Um, so this is probably the best plan to understand the full total um, scope of the project. So, and, and what what we've done is that this is Tavaray and Pioneer Park, which is shown at a larger scale on this plan. Plan number B is the area around the community hall where we are at the moment, which is the next one along. And plan number C is the uh, Toronto Dredge car parking area. Um, so they're, they're the three study areas that again have come out of our assessment of where the community thought the priority and the needs were for for Harrietville. So the project is all about um, upgrades to the functionality and the aesthetics of the area of, of Harrietville. It's not just beautification, it's not just sticking some trees in and doing the occasional path upgrade. What, what this is is the, the chance for really what is in effect a once in a lifetime project where the Shire have got considerable uh, funds that will potentially become available over time to be able to think about this and to do it once and to do it properly. Um, I guess similar to the approach that was taken for Paul Punker. If anyone can think of the main street of Paul Punker, there was $2 million spent there some time ago where it involved removing great sections of roadway, a new shelter, new parklands, new street upgrade, that sort of thing. So in the case of Paul Punker, that won't happen again in probably in the lifetime of people that are around now. So what I would say is that this has been, we said this from the, from the beginning, this is the chance to do, to fix things that are, um, and, and essentially raise the 
quality of the open space in Harrietville. Now, one other thing that I should say before we begin is we heard very strongly that there were parts of Harrietville that general character is something that we don't want to mess around with. The sort of informal nature dominated character is something that a lot of the residents have said to us time and time again. So really from way back here at the early stages of the project, we've been very mindful not to, I guess, kind of formalize everything too much and put in curb and channel and roadway and make it too suburban or too urban, really. So that's, that's part of a driving character um, that has been a driving philosophy for all of the work that we're doing um, in order to try and make the natural landscape still dominate all of the decisions that we're making. So I might talk you through, let's, let's start with this area here, Tavaray and Pioneer Park. So, if you can um, picture where we are, um, Sue's coffee cart is about there. So, um, Poise, Skis, School Bridge, so it's all of that area in there. And one of the first things that we observed is that it's essentially, Tavaray and Pioneer Park seems as though it's two separate entities. Um, there is very much a sense of Pioneer Park at the moment being dominated by roadway and in fact so much so that this red line here is the extent of road pavement. So the first thing we ask ourselves is why is there so much road pavement here, so much sort of undefined area. So one of the first proposals is to reduce the amount of, of just sort of um, unnecessary roadway to make it more of a park than a car park but also to really, in a sense, try and link Pioneer and Tavare Park across, the, bring, it, bring it all as one entity. And in fact, one thing I should say is that the approach has been to be very light-handed in Tavare Park and really just almost leave it as it is. The existing trees and the grassland, really nothing more has to be done in that area. And there are quite a few areas in Harrietville where really there, there doesn't need to be anything done. Um, it, it, but, but there are also opportunities for bringing in an improvement in some of the amenities. But one of the challenges we found from the beginning is Harrietville, the population seems to swell at certain times of the year from visitation. Middle of winter, middle of summer, Easter, there's just this massive influx of people that come into the area. And so there, that does need to be taken into account and designed for, but at the same time, um, we've had a lot of discussion about the car parking down at Feathertop, Toronto Dredge area. You know, with that could easily have 200 car parking spaces that are set aside, but it just doesn't warrant, it, there are very few times of the year where it warrants that sort of um, volume of car parking spaces. So, just quickly back to the, I guess, the overall driving ideas for Pioneer and Tavare Park. Um, the first idea is to essentially rationalise the car parking, to still have the ability for vehicles to move through here, bus stop, caravan, bike drop off, a number of designated car parking spaces and then out again. But what it does is it frees up all of this area in here for there to be a new shelter structure. And in fact, while Ed and I were eating our sausage rolls from Fiona's cart today, we thought, wouldn't it be good to be standing under a shelter here when it's pouring with rain? So, the opportunity here is to have a shelter structure that is somewhat, somewhat of sort of a, um, a picnic area, but also where some informative signage can be placed in this area here. One of the things that seemed to be missing from the, from the stories that we were told and, and the conversations with people was there seemed to be missing sort of a bit of a, a heart to Harrietville, a centralised focus. And I'm not talking about a... I'm not talking about something like Mafking Square, that's sort of an urban space, but it seemed as though someone couldn't really pinpoint the, the ceremonial or, or um, the, the sort of the heart of where Harrietville is. And so really what this project is doing, it's proposing to make this, to turn this area into more of the public heart of Harrietville, right in amongst the parklands. So, so what that means is a new shelter structure, New toilets, proper toilets, you know, ones that actually work, and, and four of them. Um, so, some paved areas for seating, somewhere where all of the trails join at one point, somewhere where people would sort of come as a first stop as they're entering into Harrietville. Um, I guess an area for probably where, the, where tourists would likely gravitate to as a first starting point. But also, you know, equally, arguably more importantly, is somewhere where you can all go and have a picnic and, and, and spend some time in the park environment there. 
That's the existing bridge, no plans to do any changes to that, um, other than some seating on either side of it. This area over here was designated more as the bike trail stop and start, so there would be bike um, bike racks and sort of somewhere where you begin and end the because that connects off to the, the great bike trail. Um, the, re, the proposal is to replace the two small rotundas in this area with something that's a bit more uh, designed and a bit more contemporary. We've got some ideas that we showed you last time for that. And so that they. Pardon? What's wrong with those rotundas? Well, they're okay, yeah, they're okay, um, but they are also we think a little bit of their time, and and I think one of the things is if, again, this being a once in a lifetime project, if it is that we are proposing to do something new and um, a, a new design proposal, then there is an opportunity to then think, well, what about if we replace those rotundas and put another one in, so that it all starts to feel as though it's sort of a, a, the whole design has been considered as, as a single entity rather than sort of remnants of things that have happened at various times. This is, again, this is, this is one of those projects that has, um, I think we need to all be bold and brave and to think a little bit bigger than trying to rework with things that are already here that are probably okay but will need to be replaced in, you know, before too long. So that was, that was the proposal for that. Um, so you're replacing two with one, is that what you No, doing? replacing two with three. So replacing these two, so there's the, um, this one's the, replacing two in a similar location. Uh, in fact... That's a lot of money spent for something that's already there, that ain't broken. Yeah. But the other thing is that with these, if we were to design these properly, then we could have a barbecue in each, we could have a picnic table in each. They could be a little bit more sort of functional so that a, a group of people, a family group could work, could work, could, um, could, could be uh, entertained in, in each one of those areas. The old we got to do have those, they do have a fairly wide maintenance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, it's that thing of if you replace something new that looks completely different, then it makes the older things look a little bit um, in contrast and out of date. I've got a question at the back. Come yeah, forward, please. Preferably, uh, as a power parrot or resident, I prefer not to be homogenised. I prefer to keep Pioneer Park as the original, and, uh, and the across the river is more of a Victorian progression from it started as pioneers went into a Victorian era as opposed to the homogenized all being one one entity mm -hmm. because in Haribo we do actually prefer to have the two different characters okay. just for your just for yeah. your interest. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the the fact that we've got a, a river running through it, there will always be a separation. We're, we're not proposing a bridge crossing or to fill the, the creek in to, you know, to be able to... It's a look. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think the other thing is there's, that there are certain characters and, and a lot of the character of this side is dominated by native trees, whereas on this side it's dominated by deciduous exotic trees. And that, that's something that is that does make sense to keep a bit of... Uh, separation, but I guess it's probably more of a visual thing, really. That, that, that the idea is, if you go to this area here, and this starts to feel a bit more like a park, and you look across and you think, oh, I'll go over to that side, it almost tends to, the, the circulation, we think, is really important to be able to link both sides together. So, um, okay, so what we talked about, can I bring your attention across to, all the way along to here, the last time we were here, we showed initial concepts for the, the main shelter, which is which is proposed just here. So a shelter structure that for a day like this would be just magnificent. And so this is the design proposal that we showed last time for that shelter. Um, I guess the inspiration came from a number of things. Uh, whenever we're designing uh, structures and in fact any landscape treatments, we search very hard for elements and drivers that are of local identity. There's so many uh, rotundas and structures that could be anywhere. You could have bought it from Bunnings in somewhere and you put it in and it's just you know, sort of generic. Um, what we've proposed here is, is ideas that are of this place. So we looked back through history and we did some research and we obviously came across the notion that, well, 
not the notion. We came across the history that gold had been an important uh, originating driver of, of the community in this area. Um, so there were a number of factors. Gold was important, even the Chinese settlement was important. And again, with it, without being sort of trying to make it look overtly Chinese, we had, there was an opportunity to have uh, a subtle nod to that, almost a, um, a gesture that is, that is having some sort of uh, reference to that. Obviously the natural environment, and this is really important. So the forests, the trunks of the trees, the very vertical treed elements, um, trying to dredge, this was, a, this was a bit of a difficult structure to, um, to weave into the narrative, but the use of the corrugated iron um, and, and the sort of vernacular architecture, that is the Toronto Dredge building that used to be there. I guess we put all of those elements together and come up with the idea of a, a fairly large roofed structure that has a little bit like folded origami. So it has folds on the inside. The underside of it would be a goldish color. Um, the peaked, sorry, go around this side. These sort of peaked roofs have a little bit of a hint to a pagoda. Again, without being sort of overtly Chinese, there's a, if, if you know the connection and you see it, then it, it becomes obvious. Um, all of the posts that hold up the roof line is very much referencing the timber, the forest from the timber, and it would be really lovely if we could source local timbers that are very rough cut and you know, sort of quite rugged in, in their formation. Um, and then, of course, the roof line, which, which is um, off of a corrugated iron sort of material. So all of those elements has gone in, have gone in to the main structure itself. What we heard last time was we had a, lot, we had a much, much more yellow colour that was shown in, in the renders, almost a bit like the colour on the back wall there. Um, and that was, we, we started thinking, wouldn't it be great for that to be a really strong yellow colour? Some people loved it. Some people thought it was a bit too... Um, brash or um, a bit too striking, I would say. So one of the progressions we have we have made is that the colour itself has been toned down quite significantly, and then also elements of of ply <coughs> timber sheeting has been added into the structure. So that was one of the things that last time we came we showed you something that looked similar to this. Um, I think nearly everyone liked the posts. They, they were quite. They liked the form of it but felt as though the, the colour that was chosen was a bit too bright. Um, so that's a progression that was in response to what we heard last time. That also is represented in, um, one of the ideas is to also brand the township, is to have two entry signs. I'm gonna run back to this plan to show you where they are. So one that occurs just here. So that's the, that's um, School Bridge, Hoys, skis, right at that point, that's the bottom pub just there. So the point here at which you would drive into town, and as we know, you can either go straight ahead over School Bridge or turn left to Toronto. Um, that it seemed logical to put an entry sign there that says Harrietville at that point, and then all the way down here, just as you come off the mountain, there's, there's an opportunity for another signage element there. So in order to tie in the new elements of this the shelf structure with this, we've chosen the same colour. But again, the feedback that we had last time was that it was a bit too yellow and not sort of golden and, and um, sort of orangey gold enough. So the colour of that has been toned down quite significantly from what we showed you last time. Um, in addition, while we're talking about signage, um, I was having a conversation earlier about how there's um, there are many levels of signage messaging that are appropriate. The first one starts with, you're coming into Harrietville, it says Mountain Village now, not Welcome to Historic Harrietville. There was a vote taken last time and people felt that Mountain Village was the right tagline to have on, on the signage element here. This particular sign gives you, in a sense, uh, it tells you quite a bit of information all at the same time. It tells you that the town centre and the largest panel of the sign is directing people straight ahead along Great Alpine Road. That's the primary route through town. But also at the same time it's also saying, but hang on a minute, there's also something to see as if you were to make a left turn there as well. So that's the reason for the largest portion of the sign being heading that way. So that's, that's sort of signage um, category number one. 
Then category number two is where there's an opportunity for signage elements to label other town amenities, like the community hall here. So that, again, it all becomes part of the same design suite of furniture and materials and um, you know, the folded forms that we're seeing here are very much similar to the folded forms of the main structure. It all starts to have a theme and a character that ties everything together. And then, of course, there's a tertiary signage element, which is which you've got already. Um, the, the very the beautifully designed um, trail signs, and they're great uh, pieces of information, but they're of a different order of messaging to to the main signs and, and the labelling of of community um, facilities, essentially. These two renders here, sorry about the bump in that one, that's the, that's the winder, but hopefully you can see these two renders are of the three smaller shelters that are proposed over in Tavare Park. They're essentially small versions of the big one, um, just enough room to be able to have a barbecue in each, a, a generous picnic table in each, and a bench seat. So again, the idea is that a small family group could use each of those. And we've been here We've been coming here for years now at different times of the year and in the middle of summer you cannot get a picnic table in the shade for love or money. Um, on a day like this you would actually want to be undercover and at other times you want to be outside and out in the open. So the, the, the idea is to have a number of different configurations within the park so that there are some picnic tables outside just under the trees and others that would have a little shelter area here. Someone spoke to me about indigenous culture and heritage and that one of the things about Harrietville is that there are so many layers of history that, that are at the moment represented by multiple signs and plaques and all sorts of things going on, especially in Pioneer Park. So our thinking was that that's really interesting um, information for people to, to hear about and to digest. One of the ideas is that there's an opportunity here for uh, stories and narratives and all sorts of interesting information to be essentially imprinted on the underside of the roof here so that you know if you've got time and and not everyone will notice that on their first visit but you've got lots of opportunities for um, uh, basically information to be portrayed stories narratives all sorts of um, European settlement and pre-European settlement ideas to be printed up on the roof area here. It's almost like reading a book on the underside. So that just adds another layer of, of information. I guess we felt primarily that this is the main shelter is probably the main go-to point for people coming into town. So again, you know that whole thing of I'm driving in, where do I go? And and if the messaging is that really <coughs> This, this whole area in here should probably be your first point of call as a visitor. Then if we can have more than just picnic <coughs> tables and, and, and a shelter, but if we can have information here um, and even historical information, well presented historical boards that give, give stories of the local, um, you know, the local settlement and all sorts of things, um, that seemed to be a good logical location to, to put that information in. Um, I'll talk really quickly about the community hall. This was fairly uncontentious, I must say. Most people were generally supportive of this as a project, although interestingly enough, this kind of fell down into the third tier category, third tier of importance. Importance number one, we'll get to this in a moment, was really fixing up the car parking at Toronto Dredge area as a result of the big visitations, of vi um, peak visitations of cars over Easter and, and, and summer holidays, so that's probably the most important project in people's minds, followed by this, and the community hall, of course, which is where we are now. All of this, all of this area in here that I'm shading is the extension that was proposed, and the plans are, yes, they're still on the back wall there. So, essentially, this was really just fixing up. Uh, it was incorporating the extension that's proposed to go out in that direction, still allowing the functionality of car parking at the entry, fixing up the getting rid of the puddle for a start at the front there, um, a long bench seat for people to sit at, really making it a little bit more of an inviting entry plaza into this area, all of a modest scale, but really just allowing some more sort of amenity and hard paved areas for the sort of events that you have in, in, in that would take place in the community hall. 
Now, the most discussion we had was not about any of that. It was about car parking at this area here. So this is better top track, roadway down to Toronto Dredge. Um, and I'm going to draw in again. This red line here is the extent of it's sort of road, it's not really road. All of all of all of that area there is gravel at the moment. In fact it's muddy gravel at the moment. There's water kind of sheeting off all the way through here and it's like a swimming pool. So the first thing when we came to the area was we thought, well, why is there just so much gravel? Why is there so much pavement? Why can't we be clever about minimizing where cars and vehicles go? Obviously still making provision for all the vehicle movements that need to take place. So the first suggestion was, what about if the roadway comes to a point here, it gives us all of that area there that can be turned into park, not car parking area. That was probably number one. We heard um, when we were here in February, probably as a result of you know the the, um, the summertime, that the dust down to Toronto Dredge was a big problem. So one of the first things we heard that needs to be done is that, that, that at least a portion of that roadway needs to be sealed. And I think in doing that, what it does is, this is a confusing, for people visiting the area for the first time, and I know, again, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about residents that use it all the time, that know your way around, and we're talking about visitors who come here without knowing the area. I think we need to cater for both. First time we came here, we drove up this guy's driveway because I didn't know where I was going. There was no signage, it was all, so you've got one, two, three potential roads, I don't know, we'll pick one. We ended up here and having to turn around and come back. So by sealing this roadway, what it's really doing is it's making people quite aware of the fact that, well, this is private property. If you're going to the destination, which is trying to dredge down here, you follow along that road. It's, it makes it a lot more simple. It's really, it's sort of intuitive wayfinding. It, it, it makes, it makes it clear where the road is, and more, more importantly, where the road isn't. So that was the first thing we proposed to do. Um, car parking, there's, there's clearly a need for some car parking in this area here. Uh, you know, we heard stories of the, the area filled with cars, no one knew where to park, it was all just a bit of a shambles when, when there were a lot of people visiting. So, um, this looks completely different to what you saw last time when you were here. We had for those that were here, we had a car park that ran north-south in this direction. We had two rows. Um, we had assumed, incorrectly, that uh, allowing caravans into this area was a good thing. We heard very strongly last time that discouraging caravans from being in this area is the way to, to approach it. So now the, there are ways of doing that. The car park is now designed such that a caravan can't really get in it. And it, it could try and get in, but it makes it, it's a little bit more difficult. It's not encouraging caravans to stop here and to, you know, to stay overnight, basically. Um, the other thing is, you know, we've, we've got the need for longer vehicles, like trailers and bike, um, cars with bikes on the back. So that's the reason for running the car parking in this slightly unconventional manner, which is that you come in around that way, you can park a longer vehicle right in the middle there, or if it is that you've got a, sh you've got a shorter vehicle, you can fit double in through there. That, so that caters for those longer vehicles. And then parking along that side and parking on that side. There is proposed to be two toilets here, which we heard loud and clear last time was a really good idea. Um, another one of those smaller shelters here, and only one this time. So we had proposed another couple down in here, and I think generally, the feedback was, yeah, it's not really, doesn't really warrant that level of, um, well, expenditure, but also, would anyone really use them? So, those two shelters have gone, and we've put a few more trees in this area here, so that it becomes more, more parkland. And really, one of the big opportunities in this area is to just smarten it up, and to make areas that are grass, look proper grass, put some new trees in, define where the vehicles go, order and organize it, neaten it up a bit, so that it caters for, for visitors, um, but also looks pleasant all, all year round. And one of the challenges we had with this is arriving at how many cars do we need to allow for? We heard anecdotal evidence that there were 200, 300 cars in this area over summer. We had traffic count data undertaken, so a traffic engineer who's part of our team analyzed traffic count data over the Easter weekend that told us exactly how many cars actually drove 
in this area here, and it, con it gave us the conclusion that that's the number of car parking spaces that we would need to have. 24 regular spaces, 36 if trailer parking was not in use, six central parking trailers, spaces for trailers, and then one drop-off for minivans, which was also something that a user that we heard last time was necessary. Um, a more modest kind of meeting plaza here. So the idea, I guess, the main function of this space here is that we envisage that this is where you would come, um, get ready, go to the toilet, have a sandwich, have a drink, and head off on one of the trails. And then, and the reverse, you'd come back, probably be waiting for the stragglers to come back. You know, you'd come back to your car, um, and then, then head off. It's not a real destination in, in, in and of itself, but it is, we heard, quite an important um, way of organising this area so that it can be used by, um, by visitors. Then, of course, you know, there is the need for a proper path that goes down to Trono Dredge so that you're not walking on the roadway. And then also, continuing the connection, the bridge crossing is just about here. So actually formalising that bend around further top track, some new trees would maybe lovely, and then really making that area just, and, and as you see by the tree canopies, um, making it a lot more pleasant and still functioning as a, a proper car park. Gravel, not curb and channel, not bitumen, so it's got an informal character to it. Um, the other thing is, of course, it needs to expand. So if it were that there were, I don't know, 200 people coming, then it can, you can park on the grass towards Tom's place, a certain distance through to here. So it has, does have an overflow capacity for more cars to park in, in that direction there. Um, so that's probably the biggest, that, that, that plan is the biggest change from what you saw last time, the biggest evolution. And in fact, it's been completely turned on its head and reconfigured and, and redesigned. Um, again, the shelter structure and the, the yellow has been toned down to be far more of a subdued gold colour. Um, and then what we'll talk about next is that's what you've seen to date. What you haven't seen yet is discussion of materials. So what is the ground pavement going to look like? Lighting, see that black plan there? That's the, that's the lighting plan that shows where we're proposing to put some lighting at night time. Planting species all the way down the end, you need to set of binoculars to be able to see it, and then um, staging and budgets right on the far end of the, of the plan there. Ed, can I hand it to you to talk about materials? So I might start with lighting and planting materials. Um, okay. One thing we've sort of noticed about Harrietville when you come into town at night, it's quite a dark town, it's not a whole lot of street lighting, which actually has a really nice kind of village close feel to it. But one thing we, we did think was if you were driving along the Great Alpine Road, and you would be able to see something in the distance, see something that was that was glowing, had this really nice warm feel to it. Actually, be quite a, a welcoming, inviting entry. So, again, it's a little bit small for you to see, but just some some soft, warm uplighting to the main sign. So you've sort of got this beacon in the distance. You see it; it tells you clearly where to go into town or down to the train edge. Um, the other thing uh, that also occurred to us is this sort of this this heart of Harryville, which we've been speaking about, the main central shelter area. If you were to find a way where we could up like that, again, you'd get this kind of almost blackness around it, this lovely, warm, inviting up lighting, especially on days and nights like tonight when it's freezing cold and you've got this kind of warm, inviting shelter space. Um, we thought that was a really, really nice thing to be able to do. Um, the same would apply for the, the shelter in the Trona Dredge car park. Um, Again, just kind of that, it's, it's even at sort of you know, 4 or 5 p.m., it starts to get dark, it starts to feel a bit cold. If you're a hiker or you're coming in from a long trip, you've got somewhere where you can see what you're doing, you can sort of reset before you do the next thing. Um, yeah, obviously, a nice thing to be able to do. Um, we've spoken about signage, so we're, we're also thinking some of the, the sort of secondary signage would also have uplighting. So, Trona Dredge Hall, Community Hall would also have some uplighting. Um, and then any other key signs within the, the park itself. Um, pole lighting, I'm not sure if you, any of you can see that, I remember that from Port Punker, but there's these beautiful, just simple, elegant pole lights. We're only proposing a few of those, so um, just throughout the main park spaces. We're not sort of, I suppose, trying to light every space perfectly so you can see everything in front of you. It's, it's more um, having some nice spill lighting so that it's safe to use, you can get from A to B within those spaces. Um, in terms of materials, 
So you guys have got a really good base here of materials. You've got beautiful rock stonework, you've got beautiful um, exposed aggregate gravel paving, timber work, like you've got a really good base to sort of to, to springboard from. Um, well, Punk was quite different. There wasn't a whole lot of natural um, existing references, so we introduced things like timber and Corten. But um, in Harrietville, yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot that's already happening which we can, which we can reuse. Um, beautiful stone, stone walls, nice big, generous timber seating benches. We like the idea that if you're a, a local with a big family group, you can kind of come onto a big um, picnic table, spread out your stuff. If you're a hiker, you can do the same thing. That kind of that there's room to do it. Um, Got barbecues, drinking fountains, all the kind of the usual stuff. Again, we're not, not proposing to reinvent any of that. The ceiling, um, so for the shelters and for the, the entry signs, we're proposing an anodized aluminium, which is basically like a gold, sort of um, slightly reflective um, material, which we think would work, would work really nicely. Um, fly ceiling for the rest of it, some signage, there's a whole heap of historical information in Harrietville, which would to be incorporated into that signage. Um, there's a whole piece of work involved in that, but an um, important piece. Um, on to planting. Again, it's probably a little bit far for some of you to see, but we love the kind of um, the mixed nature in Harrogate. You've got areas that are almost like bushland, other bits where there's lots of exotic trees. So we're sort of proposing again to, to um, reinforce that. So um, you can maybe come and have a look if you really want to have a look at the different species. But but generally, the, the river area, um, the river would be more native um, towards the car park where you want some sunlight coming in, maybe more deciduous exotic trees in those locations. Um, I think as Andrew might have mentioned, the walk from the bridge all the way to the Strona area. When we first came up here, it was middle of summer, and you sort of have this you know, 200 metre stretch where you're just absolutely in the middle of the sun, there's nowhere to go. So having a nice uh, continuation of pin oaks all along there would be really um, improve your comfort through that area. Um, on to staging, so as Andrew said, we originally thought the very first time we were here that community centre was, was the number one ticket item. Um, last time when we were here we, we definitely heard that wasn't the case, that Toronto was the, the main, um, main place we should be looking at. Um, so basically in terms of staging, stage 1A would be uh, sealed road down to the dredge hole, 1B would be um, this is all for your review and input, obviously. One B would be the actual the car parking area and the shelters. Um, 2A and 2B are the main, main parks in the central of town, which also include the entry areas. And stage 3 would be the community centre. Um, so this recognises that we can't do everything all at once. There's a, there's a, there's a funding um, mechanism here where the Shire will need to apply for grants and, and and find the resources to be able to do the works bit by bit. Um, so we've needed to, I guess, follow the prioritisation that we heard from the community about which are the most important projects, really beginning with the, the ceiling of Toronto Dredge. We heard last time was, you know, if you, could, if you could do one thing tomorrow, what would it be? And that was really the answer, was to seal that. Now that was, that was straight after summer when the dust was a problem. So, but anyway, nonetheless, those, the sequencing of what would happen when is reflected in the staging plan to Ed's uh, right there. And then of course, what we've done is to identify very detailed costings for each and every item that you see here, which is the plan way down the end there on the far wall, uh, following the proposed staging delineation and gives a dollar value for each of those uh, stages as they would be implemented. What is the timing overall? Overall? The yeah, what is the timing to be completed? Time? Yeah, look, um, we don't know, to be no honest. To, well, so, it's so, months, years? It's, it's, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask yeah, sure. Alan. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 a, it's a very important question, yes, and one that we need to answer. So it's very much driven by funding and availability. So as an example, we did a similar exercise in stage plan was going to go up to 2033. Due to the push power funding we got the recovery injection of funds, we've been able to secure funding to bring that forward. And most of that work will be completed in 2024. So uh, we're aware of the new fund that's been announced just over the weekend. And this potentially is one of the projects, or certainly quite a lot of people looking to um, 
so that the application. So it's really good and by that. Um, these projects are that big, it's sort of hard to find out of these weights, so you kind of have to look for the state. Or we could just up the weights. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <They're not suggesting. laughs> well, the guy, one thing you said that the road is priority, is that going ahead? Yes. Uh, nevertheless, yes, it is. Thank you very much. We have <laughs> finally managed to get all the consents to start the weights on the car park on the road. Just not just the road, the road. It's here. Yeah. So Tim Taylor, Tim Taylor is the project manager that's here. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So we should talk about dollars. Yeah. Can you just quickly run through each of the so various sites? So overall, we've um, currently clustered at about 3.364 million. Um, but Pioneer and Tabray Park is about 2.2. So by way of example, Port Punga was 2.1 for the whole, that main park roadway entry site, so kind of pretty comparable in a lot of ways. Um, the, uh, so, so in terms of what the sort of spending goes to, about a third of that is sort of uh, things like paving and toilets um, signage, so there's a $300 provisional, $300,000 provisional sum in there as well. Um, community centre is $267,000, which is the stage three. Yeah, I just didn't get a chance to mention the power lines as a potential future stage five, which would be underground in the power lines. Um, we, 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 most interested in that last page over there where everything is, is costed. Emily's reminded me, of, reminded me of one thing. Um, we are proposing the use of timber, uh, both for seating elements, as they've described, the really big, generous benches and big, uh, sort of oversized picnic tables, but also timbers for vertical elements that hold up the, the, the ceiling of the shelter structure. When we started doing work around timber, it, it came to, to our knowledge that there was, in a sense, a bit of a lack of um, understanding from the Shire's ongoing maintenance perspective. Should the timbers be continually stained, you know, sanded and stained or painted, or should they be just left to go grey? And wh where it came to light was the shelter structure in Porpunka that we designed. We had inadvertently intended for that just to be left to grey, to, for, the, for the timbers to just go silver. And the first time we drove back after a while and it was this burgundy red colour and we thought what is going on and so obviously the maintenance crew had continued to paint those timbers or to stain them a certain colour so that has fed into discussions that we've been having for Harrietville and Tawonga where we've actually identified and in fact they even showed it graphically as the two different types of timber one is which you would continue to stain and pour oil and others that are just simply left to the elements that would intentionally grow at go a sort of silvery weathered colour. So for all of the posts for the shelter structure, they would be allowed to just silver off. Um, whereas things that you come into contact with, such as the bench seat and the picnic table, we think it appropriate to, um, to continue to stain them. So there's a code on the plans that has, has shown up since you saw it last time, probably more for council's maintenance team than anything, but it has been an important point of discussion with the Shire to give direction on where tim how timber is to be treated in, in the longer term and, and how that ties in with the overall aesthetic vision for the project so that we don't have any burgundy red timber posts here as, you know, as may, be the, may be the case. I think that's probably given you a bit of a sense of where we were in February, where we've come to in terms of updates and new more detailed information that we've put on the table. Um, again, we, we, I should have said at the beginning, we, uh, the reason for being here is to receive feedback and your thoughts and um, it's not too late to, uh, and obviously we're the third step along in the process, so if anyone tells us that they really, really think that um, a site over here should be the main part of the project, we probably won't have ears for that because we've, been, we've, we've gone through that testing of where we saw the community's priorities are, um, but nonetheless, I'll throw it open for any 
comments and observations and thoughts that you may have, and we're happy to answer any, any questions on, on the information that you see here. Um, my first um, concern is the car park here um, at Toronto. Uh, unless there's some sort of agreement with the government, it gets so intensely hot. Six hours middle of the day, because it's quite a big sun patch area up there. That um, would be possible to have some other vegetation to grow and provide shade for those. Or, yeah, possibly. yeah, it normally would, but, but, but for the power lines through there. Right. Um, and so, as you see, this. Um, yeah, we, we would like to put more trees. It would make sense for these that sort of avenue of trees to continue along a certain distance along further top, but the power lines really preclude that, so that's the reason for it. And having said that, um, there may be there may be something in being able to put smaller trees along you know, along that area there. I guess the thinking has been, as you can see, a number of large growing trees within the car park itself um, to provide an amount of shade. Um, really take your point, it is baking hot here in the middle of summer and you you know, you know, feel the back of your head getting a bit burnt. So these are all new trees, these are all new trees. So there's a, there's a significant amount of new tree cover proposed. Um, but yeah, there is there is just that thing of the, the necessary offset from, um, from the power lines along that section. It's more a language thing than anything, but yep. that car park is also for the bungalows for the yes. walking drivers. Yes. And in talking of it, referring to it all the time as the Toronto Dredge car park, yep. is... Is wrong. Is. Well, yeah, most people, if they're going to the Dredge, will the park come we'll to go, the Dredge? Yes. Because yep. they're not going to carry all the yeah, stuff sure. that they have. That, so that's a really good point. We keep referring it to as the Toronto Dredge car park because yeah. it is... So but you're you're we, absolutely we right. We set up a temporary... We, the temporary bungalow spur car park. Yes, yes I've seen it. Yep. I think <laughs> John actually, actually served the bungalow. <laughs> oh, and, and, I agree. And, and, yeah, but no, sorry. Bungalow and bungalow. Yeah. Yes. yes. No but question. No the question. Si signage Can we is the key. And, and in fact, okay. as you see, the, the yellow dots represent signage, and, and this is where it makes a great deal of sense to not only not only have a sign that says it this way to the dredge hole, but also to denote the beginnings of where the various tracks are that originate from. Um, Sorry, as I said at the beginning, what you talked there, it's a language thing. Yes. In referring to it as Toronto Dredge Car Park is not quite correct. Right. Okay. Andrew, I'd say in the detailed design, that's certainly something we have consider, like what do we want to call this because it's servicing all these new yeah. things. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the note here says directional signage for bungalow and Bonacord spur trail heads. <laughs> and so, yeah, it, we've fallen in by default calling it the Toronto Dredge car park because it's in the area, but your point is taken. Yeah. So our point is garbage bins in that area obviously have to be very important and they have to be easily picked up. Yes. Um, and the trucking centre, is that being thought about? We've got a garbage bin just there. So on, on the plan here, we've got coding for things like drinking fountain, um, bike racks, picnic tables, RB means rubbish bin. So yes, there is proposed to be a rubbish bin. I think... Can a truck pick it up directly from there? Um, a truck would have to park here and they walk across that short distance to pick it up. Again, that's something in the detailed design, so to be really carefully considered how we're servicing all of the amenities that are put in place. Um, so in this instance, it'd be we we do a study of how much rubbish we anticipate would be generated, um, and then the bins would be put there accordingly um, and serviced accordingly. Yeah, it is a good point because as you know, as we're encouraging people, so, so say if we have a shelter and a picnic table and a barbecue, of course people will bring litter and people will. It, it's logical to put bins in those areas that we're encouraging increased visitation, and also I would say drinking fountains and bike racks and all of those things that just help all that public street furniture that helps spaces to function well. And as, as Ed pointed out, we've got a strategy for the aesthetic, um, or the selection of those material, of, of those various elements, so that we don't end up with a completely sort of alien looking um, heritage green, um, ye oldie worldy bollard that, that doesn't fit in with any of the, the aesthetic that we proposed here. Andrew, the, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, you go first. Andrew, I mean, the shell looks fantastic, but I would have thought you could have been cooler. 
what steel, what steel would have been. It was sort of rugged steel, um, reflecting the, the dredge, the mining history. Um, the, the, in, yep. the, in, the, in the structure of something. The roof of it is entirely steel, well, corrugated iron. And in actual fact, again, this is a detailed thing that we'll need to yeah. work through. Timber alone won't hold up that roof. Yeah. Uh, well, it will for a couple of years, but then the timbers will. So there will need to be steel elements that are 